All right, our text will be James chapter number 3. James chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 9. And I'd like to preach a different kind of message. Uh, This message is a little out of the ordinary, although I think it will be beneficial to you. And you can see from the board that we're going to talk about four curses on Christianity. Four curses on Christianity. Look in James chapter number 3, verse number 9. He says, James chapter 3, verse number 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be, that the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Christianity should be nothing but a blessing. However, there are curses on Christianity that have turned this thing into a bitter taste as the world views Christianity. Now, I want you to understand some things historically because all churches are not the same. Just because there's a church and there's a steeple and you open it up and there's all the people doesn't mean it's a Bible preaching church speaking forth the words of life. And so we have to clarify some things, and I've identified four curses, I call them, on Christianity. And I want to go through these briefly. And let me say this. I'm not bashing all churches that aren't like ours. As a matter of fact, um, I'm going to give some admonition at the end for us as Christians, individually as our church. I'm not bashing all churches. And let me say this. This is not an exhaustive study of these divergent views of Christianity at all. This is just a short synopsis to hopefully give you kind of a panoramic view historically of Christianity and how there are four main curses that, and by that I mean they're kind of blights on Christianity. When someone who's not saved says, let me investigate the claims of Christianity, And they think about Christianity, they're not just thinking about Jesus Christ and His purity and Jesus Christ as according to the Bible, as the Bible reveals Jesus Christ. They're thinking about everything they know and see as quote-unquote Christianity. And so we have to learn what the truth is sometimes by observing what it is not. So I want to highlight these curses that have historically and currently affected how people view Christianity and Christians in particular. And I think it will be beneficial to help you as a believer to veer away from false doctrine and to stay the course as trying to live out true Christianity. I believe in biblical Christianity. The term Christian, Acts chapter 11 verse number 26 is the first time it appears. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 The term Christian was used and designated by unsaved people toward the disciples. They were describing disciples that were living disciplined lives following the tenets of Jesus Christ and the beliefs of Jesus Christ. And they were called Christians first at Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse number 26. And then the other term is used, uh, the other place is used in 1 Peter where Paul, where Peter says, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed because the Christians were being persecuted. They were suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ and their belief that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and salvation is in Jesus Christ. So the term Christian, that's the roots of the actual term Christianity, but it has been broadly applied in these other areas. And I want to go through those and hopefully bring some clarity so we can understand better how to stay straight to shoot straight, and to be a good Christian testimony in our world. The first curse is Catholicism, and by that, let me be a little more exact, Roman Catholicism. And when you look at Roman Catholicism, you have about 1.3 billion Roman Catholics worldwide. These are just estimates. You can look them up. But 1.3 billion, and Roman Catholicism (coughs) claims to be the true Christian church. And I've said this on numerous occasions. If you watch a newscast, especially a nation, uh, nationwide syndicated uh, news uh, column and newspaper or, or uh, major news network 
broadcasts, when they refer to, quote-unquote, the church, they are referring to Roman Catholicism. When you read history books, if you go to college and you go to school, high school, grammar school, uh, you pick up secular histories that talk about Christianity or sometimes uh, theological histories written by theologians. They will use the term Christianity and include Roman Catholicism in that group of, Christian, of Christianity. And I want to go ahead and proclaim, according to the Bible, that Roman Catholicism is not biblical Christianity at all. Now, Roman Catholicism, these are their claims, and I'm going to give you some, some of their actual quotes. This is from their own catechisms, the Catholic, catechism, the Catholic Church Catechism. And I'll give you some of these, briefly go through these, and rebut these with the Scripture and then we'll move on to these others. Um, they do ch claim that the Roman Catholic Church is the true church that Jesus Christ founded and that Peter was instituted as the first pope and that he, of course, was a bishop at Rome. And they use Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, where the Lord tells Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's their proof text. And they say that Peter was at Rome, but however, when you read the book of Romans, chapter number 15, notice what Paul says, verse number 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. He says in the earlier part of Romans that he wants to come to preach to those that are at Rome also. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 15. He never mentions at the end of the book, when you get to chapter 16, I commend you unto Phoebe. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, verse number 3, who are my helpers. Likewise, greet the church, verses 5, 6, 7, salute Andronicus, greet Ampelias, salute Urbane. No mention of Peter at all. There's no record anywhere in the New Testament that Peter had any type of church or did any type of ministry at Rome, period. Peter was not the first pope. You say, how come? Aren't popes supposed to be celibate? The book of Matthew, we read about Jesus Christ healing Peter's wife's mother. Uh, don't popes allow people to bow down to them and kiss their ring and call them Holy Father? If that's not an act of worship, what is an act of worship? When Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet in Acts chapter number 10, he said, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Peter's not a very good pope at all. So they claim the Catholic Church is the one true church. They say it's the one true religion which subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church. They claim infallibility. infallibility. In other words, that they, the church, can make statements and doctrinal um, proclamations and those proclamations are infallible. With Catholicism you have a threefold system. You have, you're writing a different color for you, you have the Pope, you have tradition, and you have the Bible. Now for Pope, I'm going to put church because he speaks as the head of the church. So you have these three. And what do you do when the Bible and tradition contradict? Then the church decides. And the Bible says in Matthew 23, Jesus said, don't call a religious ruler your father. That's a religious title. The church says we're going to do it anyway. And so what happens when that contradicts? The church decides. They have multiple authorities. The Bible's not the final authority. The church is by way of their own tradition. So they claim infallibility, and the infallibility extends as far as divine revelation. This is the Catholic Catechism 2035. It extends to all those elements of doctrine, including morals, with, without which the saving truths of the faith cannot be preserved, explained, or observed. And they claim that they have the right Bible, even though they have 14 additional books in their Bible, other than what you have in your Bible. 
See, there are Christians sitting in churches and they're not even aware that a Catholic Bible is not a Bible like you have in your, in your lap. You're holding a Bible and you think, oh, this is the Bible. No, there is a Roman Catholic Bible that contains 14 additional books. They're called the Apocrypha. And those apocryphal books are additional books that have been added. Apocrypha comes from the word just like apocalypse, similar to that word which means hidden. Apocryphal books, there are 14 books that are separate from what you have. Now I'll turn over to Luke chapter 24 and I'll show you that Jesus Christ never referenced the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was written in intertestamental period. In other words, between Malachi and Matthew in the intertestament time is when the Apocrypha was authored. And never do you find a reference in the New Testament to the Apocrypha. Paul even makes a reference to an unsaved poet. He says in Acts 17, even your own poets have said we are of his offspring. He, he allure, uh, uh, alludes to unsaved philosophers before he will quote the Apocrypha. Jesus never quoted the Apocrypha. The apostles and disciples never quoted the Apocrypha. There's no reference anywhere in it in the New Testament as being part of inspired scripture. Now look over in Luke chapter 24, notice when Jesus Christ appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the Bible tells us that he opens up their understanding of the scriptures. And then when you come down, when he finally meets with the ten there in verses 36 through 44, notice what it says here. Come down to um, Luke number 24, Luke chapter 24, verse number 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written, watch it, in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Alright, so we have the law of Moses. That's called the Torah. That's the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then he says all the things written in the prophets. And you know you have a lot of the prophets in the Bible, like the um, book of Isaiah and so forth. Now, the, um, the Jews, what they did, they had this thing set up a little different. They called this the Nabim. And then you have the Psalms, or the writings called the Kethubim. So you have the, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So they had the Bible divided up just a little bit different. They had the five books of Moses, but then in the prophets, in a Hebrew Bible, you're going to have Joshua, Judges, both books of Samuel, all of Kings and Chronicles, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12 minor prophets as one book. That's considered their prophets. Then you have in the Psalms which will be the writings, you would have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Job, and then you would have Ruth, and Lamentations, and Esther. Those books are included in the writings. So a lot of poetical books, stories, analogies, like the Song of Songs, and so forth. So that is the division of the Old Testament Bible, and Jesus actually gives that division. There's another interesting passage over Matthew 23 when he talks about the blood that's killed from Abel to Zacharias that they slew between the altar and the temple. Let me give you the reference here. Matthew uh, 23. You say, well, how do we know what the Old Testament canon was? A canon simply means the rule or the arrangement of, of the books that were accepted as inspired. It's Matthew 23, 35. He mentions the blood of Abel. And the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. You have A to Z, okay? You've got the beginning to the end of the Old Testament. You've got Abel in the book of Genesis, and Zacharias is in the book of Second Chronicles. That is the last book in the Hebrew Old Testament. So, obviously, Jesus and the disciples followed that Old Testament thing. So, Catholic Bible is not the right Bible. You don't need to to follow it and we don't have time to go into the errors and the craziness that's found in the Apocrypha but that's where some of the prayers for the dead and some of the uh, other purgatory and some of those things come from 
Now they teach, Roman Catholicism teaches that salvation can be earned. That salvation is not by grace through faith. Salvation earned. In other words, you work at it through by way of rituals and religion. And if you've followed our lessons on salvation, it's called sacramentalism. In other words, you have sacraments that impart saving grace so you can be saved. And you follow that by way of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's a quote from the Catholic Catechism 846. All salvation comes from Christ the head through the church which is his body. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. Catechism 82, both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. That's what I told you. Bible, tradition, church. That's not New Testament Christianity. Um, let me give you this about grace. They believe salvation is earned. Grace can be merited. Catechism 2010. Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification. Catholic Catechism 2027. Moved by the Holy Spirit, we can merit for ourselves and for others all the graces needed to attain eternal life. Now let me give you this on justification. Justification is when God justifies the sinner. You can easily remember it as just as if I had never sinned. God justifies the sinner when the sinner places his faith in Jesus Christ. And it's by grace through faith. We're justified by faith in his blood, Romans chapter number 5. Now they teach not justification by imputation, which is God imputing that to us, giving it to us. If you input something into a computer, you're putting the material into it. And God imputes it to us. They teach justification by infusion. They teach initial justification by baptism. That's how you get rid of what they call original sin. And the reason they baptize the baby is because if a baby dies without being baptized, that baby, according to their theology, will go to hell. It must be baptized to remove original sin so it can then have a chance in purgatory. Everybody's going to go to purgatory, according to Catholicism. You say, what is purgatory? It's not a biblical teaching. Purgatory, Catholic Catechism 1031, the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. Uh, Catholic Catechism 1475. In the communion of saints, a perennial link of charity exists between the faithful who have already reached their heavenly home, those who are expiating their sins in purgatory, and those who are still pilgrims on earth. Remember that word we studied if you followed our teachings on salvation? To expiate, that's to take away. How do they get away their sin? They get their sins taken away in purgatory by purging them out. And that's where indulgences come in. And that's where penance comes in. And so you have salvation earned. You have penance, and penance has to do with doing things to make up for the wrongs you've done, to confess your sins to the priest, to go make right the wrongs that you've done. You have meritorious works, often prayers and assignments and good deeds to make up for the bad that you've done. You say, what is that? That is religion. That's what people think, and the reason they think this is because of Catholicism. They think, oh, I've got to make up for all the bad I've done in order to go to heaven. That's penance. Confess their sins to a priest. And then you have indulgences. That's what got Luther all out of whack and got him to nail the, one of the things, got him to nail the 95 Thesis to the wall. Indulgences, this is actually paying things. They have treasures of merit. And these treasures of merits come from the saints like Mary, whom they pray to, and also other saints whom they can actually get the righteous works from these people attributed to them. They teach what is called a legal or forensic justification. So what does that mean? That means God, God will declare somebody just, but they have to indeed be just. They've got to live it out or they're not going to make it. So a Catholic has to do all those things. They have to take the Mass. 
And by the way, that is, of course, um, I'll just put mass. It's called the Eucharist. And they believe that you literally have to eat the bread and drink the juice in order to have eternal life. And they get that from John chapter number 6, a perversion of not taking the Bible in the way that the sense is given. Jesus Christ does not say, you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have eternal life and just stop at that. He goes on to explain, as I live by the Father, so he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood shall live by me. He's not being literal, saying you need to eat my pinky and drink my blood. He didn't eat the Father's and uh, pinky and food and body and drink the Father's blood. He said the Spirit he said, the, 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 the words I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. It's obviously a figurative expression. But what does the church teach? They teach that you have to literally partake of that flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. It's called transubstantiation. It's called the Mass or the Eucharist. And they teach, this is the Catholic Catechism. You can go look it up. This is not... In any type of secret. Catholic Catechism 1374, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. It has always been conviction, Catholic Catechism 1376, of the church and this holy council declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of His blood. Folks, that's cannibalism. And that is not Christianity. You say, what is the, what's the end result of this? What's the application here? The application is ritualism. That's what you come up with. At the end of the day, you have... Where am I going to write this? I'll write them down here. Ritualism or religion. And people think, oh, I've got to dress up and wear these certain type of funny clothes that nobody wears today. Wear these crazy things, have this holy water, holy smoke, everything's holy. You repeat these things, you do these rituals, you say these things. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, the will be done on earth is in heaven. Give us a day our daily bread and forgive us our dread. You say these things, Hail Mary, Mother of God. Give us grace in the hour of trial. You say these things over and over and over and over and over and you pray the beads that that's going to get you into heaven. That is a lie out of the pit of hell. Only faith in Jesus Christ and His atoning death on the cross, His blood being shed for you, only faith in Him is going to get you saved. This cannot save you. And that's a curse that somebody would think that's Christianity. That is not Christianity at all. And I have a, I, I get under, it gets under my skin that some of these Christians won't call it out. You want to talk about cults? There's a cult. The Catholic cult. But they won't say it. They don't want to get everybody upset because there's so many of them. And so many people claim that the Christians fought the Muslims in the crusade. No, the Catholics fought the Muslims in the crusade. All right, I got to get on. Let's move to the next one. The curse of Calvinism. Now, when we talk about Calvinism, obviously, we're dealing with a, a name that comes from a man named John Calvin. John Calvin was a reformer. He was one of the reformers that was more of a theologian and a scholar than a preacher. And he lived 1509 to 1564. And he formulated a lot of ideas and was a, a very prolific author. And the idea of predestination comes from some of the things of Calvin. Now, although I will say this, there's another guy named Augustine back in the 300s. that was also espousing views of Catholicism and teaching views of Calvinism. I need to do one more thing here that I didn't put up here. I need to put under Catholicism. I know I can't be exhaustive with this, but I need to put uh, Constantine up here somewhere. I think I'll just put him down here. Constantine, he was a Roman emperor, and around 313, he supposedly converted to Christianity. 
Now, prior to this, listen, prior to this, Christians were being killed in Rome. Well, you know, Christianity started in Rome, and Peter's the first pope, and all this kind of... How come they're killing Christians? 313, Constantine, he supposedly converts to Christianity, and what he does is he takes the ancient Babylonian practices, which is the Babylonian religion, of all of these sun gods and all these other things, even worshiping a woman and her baby. That's also seen in, in ancient Babylon worship, pagan religions. And he converted that over to Christianity. And that's a date you want to remember. So you're looking at the 300s when this stuff really began to formulate. And then later on, Augustine comes along, uh, the, late, the late 300s, 350, 360, 370, and he begins to write some of these things that espouse these teachings of Mary worship and all this other garbage. Now, Calvinism. If we're going to talk about Calvinism, we're going to talk about Protestants. And we're going to talk about Protestants. The, the dates, I mean, the, um, the numbers vary as far as how many. And it depends on what they're including. You could say 800 million, but they may be including a lot of evangelicals who are not Calvinists at all. If they're just including all Baptists, then all Baptists are not Calvinists. So therefore, those numbers, I don't know how much stock you can put, but you can talk about Protestants, and you can talk about Reformed, the Reformation. When Luther nailed his 95 Thesis, you have the beginning of the Reformation, and you have other groups come out of that. You have, obviously, the Lutherans, and then later on you have a split in England where the Church of England is formed. That's where the Anglicans come from. You have the Lutherans coming from Martin Luther, and you have the Presbyterians coming from uh, Calvin, and you have Zwingli, and you have from Lutherans and from the Church of England, you have even the Methodists with John Wesley. So if you want to talk about Protestants, there's all kind of branches and divisions that come out of this. But Calvinism as a theological system, which we've covered in some of our teachings, so it won't be completely exhaustive, it basically goes with the acronym of TULIP. And you can study it with the acronym like this, TULIP. The teaching for the T is total depravity. That means that you're so totally depraved, you can't make a decision to receive Christ. Your will is overcome. You can't decide. And they use the passage, there is none that seeketh after God. And your will is so depraved, you can't even make the choice to receive Christ. U stands for unconditional election. I guess I'll put them up here if you can read it. Total depravity. So are you a four-point Calvinist, a one-point Calvinist? I'm a zero-point Calvinist. And I know there are some people that are more extreme. I'm not saying I'm not going to make any designations over that. There are some more moderate Calvinists than others. And some preachers in their preaching, they get away from their Calvinism when they have a burden for souls. Total depravity. They say you're so totally depraved you can't even make the decision to receive Christ. U stands for unconditional election. Unconditional election. God unconditionally picks whoever He wanted to be saved before the foundation of the world. L stands for limited atonement. When Jesus Christ died, His atonement was not for everybody. It was only for the ones He picked. Because that's the only ones that are going to be saved. If Jesus Christ died for everybody according to their reasoning, then everybody would be saved. Then you have I, which is irresistible grace. When God's grace comes upon the sinner, it irresistibly controls him and regenerates him. So then he is then able to make a choice to receive Christ because without the irresistible work of God's grace, you cannot be saved. So when a Calvinist says sola uh, fide, whatever it's called, faith alone, and the, the mantra for the Reformation was, we believe in salvation by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. That brings me to P. And you think, oh, that sounds good, you know, we believe in salvation by faith alone. Yeah, but they are, what they say with the P, that is perseverance. Persevere. And when you persevere, that means you endure to the end. You live out your life in a Christian manner, proving that you were one of the elect. So really, they turn into an Armenian at the end of the day. How do you know you're one of the elect? Well, you have good works, and good works prove it, because faith without works is dead. So therefore, God irresistibly came upon you and saved you, and now you're saved, but you know that you're saved because you have good works. So that's the system. 
And this thing has all kind of problems and it is infected because it's a theological system. It's infected not just Protestants. And by the way, Luther was what you call an Augustinian monk. He already believed in predestination before he was even converted. And so that's why you see that stuff bleed over into uh, all the Reformed uh, theology. And you have all this religion and ritualism that leads and comes into Protestantism. Luther didn't teach transubstantiation, that Christ was in the uh, elements of the Mass, but he taught consubstantiation, which is a real close teaching that the elements are present there with them. And so you get into all kind of problems as it relates to baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then people begin to, especially the further you go down the road, let the lines get drawn less and less to where you have people being baptized. And according to their own scripture verses, they are baptized and now they're born again because they've been baptized into the church. And people think, when they go to some of these churches, they think, oh, I'm saved because I'm baptized. Oh, I'm saved because I took of communion and I better go take a communion or I can't go to heaven. Now, this Calvinism stuff gets into theology and it weaves its way in all types of things because it is an intellectual movement. So if I was to give a, an ism to it like I did here with ritualism, I would call it intellectualism. And I would say that because Calvinists oftentimes are well studied and the more they think, the more they get into trouble. Now, what happens with Calvinism, with the intellectualism, it becomes dead orthodoxy. And it actually incriminates God, because here's the thing, at the end of the day, it's not the devil made me do it, and it ain't really Adam and Eve made me do it. At the end of the day, it incriminates God, it's God made me do it. Because according to them, God is so sovereign. You'll see a lot of times the name of their churches, it'll have the word sovereign in it. Reformed, sovereign Presbyterian church, or sovereign Baptist church. Uh, sovereign Grace Baptist, a lot of those. And what, at the end of the day, what they're saying is God is so sovereign that He works all things according to His plan. And that's true in a balanced way, though. Because you can't have a God of love without someone having a free choice. It doesn't work that way. You can't strong arm somebody into something and saying that you gave them a choice and now they really love and you really love them. What kind of love is that? So you have incrimination of God, you're saying God made sin, and you're saying God created sinners just for the purpose of putting them into hell, because the doctrine of unconditional election also has a flip side of that. It's called the doctrine of reprobation. If God picked some people to be saved and go to heaven before the foundation of the world, that means He picked some and created souls to put them into hell. What kind of God are you serving? That thing has got into all kinds of circles. This last thing, this perseverance, has gotten into a lot of Baptist circles that are evangelical in their theology. And it's gotten into that teaching saying, well, if you don't live a good life, then you never were saved to start with. So you're just not truly saved. And they don't rightly divide the Word of God to understand that a Christian has two natures and you can do bad things just like an unsaved person. There are Christians who haven't come to church in weeks. And I'm talking to some of them because you hadn't been able to. <laughs> I'm talking about there are Christians that have put their Bible down, haven't come to church, and have given in to things of their flesh, and they're still going to heaven. You say, well, I just don't think they never were saved. Okay, what kind of criteria are you going to go with? Just, you know, some kind of criteria like somebody getting drunk or somebody fornicating or somebody going to the movies or somebody smoking cigarettes? What about the criteria of gossip? If you didn't quit your gossip and you didn't quit thinking badly about people after you got saved, I doubt you were ever saved to start with. Where does the train stop? You have to rightly divide the word of truth. It's persevering to the end. This stuff's done gotten into churches because they don't rightly divide the book of James. James is not dealing with uh, justification by faith as Paul deals with it. James is a tribulation epistle with tribulation doctrine that has to do with enduring to the end under a faith and work salvation situation in the great tribulation after the church is gone. All right, I got all that off my chest. Now let's move on to the charismatics. Charismatic movement. Now, if you've heard of the charismatic, obviously it comes from the, um, the word charisma. And you use that term sometimes. Uh, So-and-so has great charisma. But it's actually the word like this. The Greek word charisma. And that word has to do with gifts. 
He's a very gifted speaker. He has a lot of charisma. And the charismatic movement actually comes out of the Pentecostal movement, if you know anything about church history. And when you study the Pentecostal movement, some people say it kind of arose out of the fundamentalist movement. Others say it has no association at all with the fundamentalist movement. But it arose at the, around that same time, about 1900, 1906. There was a big meeting in Los Angeles, California, the Azusa Street Revival, where you had a black preacher, Seymour, I think was his name, and he was one of the preachers that, that preached. But they say that the charismatic movement arose out of the Pentecostal movement. So we'll put this uh, term Pentecostal up here. I know you've probably heard of that. Pentecost, penta means five. The, the Feast of Pentecost was an Old Testament feast day that was uh, 50 days after Passover. And so when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter number 2 is 50 days after the Jewish feast of Passover and the disciples were all assembled there. They speak in tongues. So the Pentecostal movement was a movement that goes back, like I said, around 1906. And it also has uh, association with... Uh, a few other preachers back in that time. But it has association around the time of the fundamentalist movement where people were looking forward to Jesus Christ coming. They were breaking from mainline denominations because of the corruption of modernism. And so the fundamentalist movement arose out of that. And of course, when you're in California, people are not afraid to experiment with different and new things. So the Pentecostal movement, uh, basically they remained... And Pentecostal, when you talk about Pentecostal, a lot of times you're talking about Assembly of God movements, uh, churches, and uh, uh, Church of God. The Church of God, based out of Cleveland, I believe, and the Assembly of God churches uh, out of that. Now, charismatic churches would be a little different than Pentecostal in the sense of the Pentecostals, their big thing was you do not have spirit baptism unless you speak with tongues. That was the, that was the big thing. If you did not speak in tongues, you did not get baptized with the Spirit. Now, they got that from some partial truths in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, God used tongues as a sign. And, of course, He does that to show the unbelieving Jew that God is speaking now to other people, to the Gentiles. He, you see that in Acts chapter number 10. When Peter sees the Gentiles speak with tongues, he realizes, oh, they have the Holy Ghost because the same thing happened to us back in Acts chapter number 2. You never see a case in the book of Acts where tongues are spoken and there's not a Jew present. Now, they take a partial truth like that and they say, well, if you do not speak in tongues, you don't have the evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. A lot of problems with that. One of them is Ephesians chapter number 1 where Paul the Apostle says, "...in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise." He's talking in Ephesians chapter number 1 to believers who after they believed they got the Holy Spirit. So there's no indication that you do not have the Holy Spirit if you don't speak in tongues. Nevertheless, that was the big thing with the Pentecostal. The charismatic movement is more focused on all the gifts in general, and they do not discriminate, neither toward, number one, um, moving out of their mainline denominations, or number two, that you have to have the gift of tongues to be, quote-unquote, spirit-baptized. So they will stay in their churches. They're actually in the 60s and 70s. This movement really got going big. You've heard of Calvary Chapel churches back in California. Um, uh, Chuck Smith, the pastor there, the Calvary Chapel churches were real, real big in what you would call the charismatic movement. A lot of the non-denominational churches were very um, uh, popular there with the charismatic. It's estimated, again, I don't, you know how I am with numbers, 584 million Charismatic and Pentecostal. 584 million. And so the charismatic, and I say charismatic movement, and maybe hit that more than just saying Pentecostal because they do oftentimes stay in their churches. There are Baptist churches that are charismatic. I've heard some Baptists say I'm, uh, 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 what are they called? Bab 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 
they'll make statements to say, I'm Baptocostal. In other words, they're saying they don't mind if somebody in their church stands up and speaks in tongues and, and uh, claims biblical healings and all kind of those things. So they focus on the gifts. It's always about gifts. Now, let me give you this about the tongues thing real quick. When you see tongues in the New Testament, tongues always a language. It's never gibberish. They call it glossiolia. Glossiolia is just someone talking and they actually have people where they get them to practice in tongue and practice their gifts, you know. They'll just get the tongue to rolling. There are groups that aren't even professing Christians that do not believe in Jesus Christ that get in a frenzy with the music, running around, and they have these rituals where they have glossiolia, where they begin to speak in gibberish. Linguists that scholars have sat down in these churches back in the 70s when the stuff got real popular, a lot of them begin to tape, get tape recordings or even go to the services, people that know all these languages, and they can't discern languages. In the Bible, it's always a language. In Acts chapter 2, the languages are actually listed. You say, what about 1 Corinthians 14? It says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth and my understanding is unfruitful. Yeah, the understanding bears no fruit. If somebody's sitting in the congregation and you're praying in an unknown tongue, they don't know what you're talking about. There's no fruit coming from that. It's an unknown language. Well, it's the language of heaven. Anytime in the Bible God speaks out of heaven, it's always Hebrew. So this stuff is, a, is foolishness. Now, tongues is always a language. And notice also that tongues is a sign gift. 1 Corinthians 1.22, I guess I'll write a few of these verses up here. 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Bible says, Tongues are for a sign to the Jews. Let me give you the actual quotation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I, I misquoted the Bible here. Verse one, number 22, 1 Corinthians 1, For the Jews require a sign... And the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews require a sign. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. You can look at that. I'll give you that passage. That's Mark chapter 16. The last few, I think it's verse uh, 16 or 18 here. These signs shall follow them that believe. Let's give the list here. Look at it. These are signed, signed gifts. The reason I say signed gifts and make a distinction because there are other gifts listed in Paul's epistles, the gift of wisdom and charity and other things that are listed there that have nothing to do with these outward visible signs to prove that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Mark chapter number 16, verse number 17. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. There's five of them right there. Now, I have a whole church full of people, obviously not now, but people that I know are saved and profess to be saved and none of those signs are following them. They've never followed. I've never done any of these things. Are you telling me I'm not saved? What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with the fact it takes until 1906 for any of this stuff to start showing up? What are you going to do with the fact that the tongues in the Bible is a literal language and the stuff that these people are saying is not a literal language at all? What are you going to do with the fact that all these things go together, and that includes drinking deadly poison and picking up snakes, which they try to do in North Georgia mountains and some of the other places, and a lot of them wind up dying. Some of them don't, but you have some heathen out here that sometimes get bit by a snake, and they don't die either. It doesn't mean they're filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, come on, put your thinking cap on. Don't sign out your, uh, all, all, uh, all of your sanity when you pick up the Bible. You say, what's going on here? They're not raising anybody from the dead either. They raise people from the dead. They heal people. How many people with this COVID-19 stuff have been healed in these charismatic churches? Well, you know, they really have the gifts. 
It's a bunch of garbage. I'm telling you, they are charlatans. And I don't know some of the preachers that are not the big time deceivers. They are so... And let me, t let me say this. You can be convinced of so many things. Your mind can play tricks on you. You can be filled with a sense of confirmation of something. And this is what I want to go with this one on a practical application. Because what we're dealing with, we're dealing with somebody taking a signed gift that had to do with the apostles and their converts. That's why it's called the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to show you that I'm the Messiah. And he did all the miracles, right? And he said, greater works than these shall I do, because I go to my Father. They did greater works. They were a sign and a testimony to the Jewish people. The Jewish people said, we don't want to believe. So what happened? The signs left. Acts 28. You have a division there. You have Acts 7. You have Jerusalem. Acts chapter 13. You have, a, you have uh, oh, what is it? Samaria, Asia Minor, or Syria, Asia Minor. Acts 18, may have my, my locations wrong. Acts 28 is Rome, and Paul's addressing the believers there, and he says, salvation's gone to the Gentiles. At the end of Paul's ministry, he told Timothy to use a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities, and he said, I left Trophimus at Miletum sick. I thought Paul had the power of healing. How come he couldn't heal Trophimus? The sign gifts cease with the apostles. You say, why? Because they were assigned to the Jews. We're living in a period now called the blindness of Israel, and the Jews are blind, and they don't want the truth as a nation. And we are to live by faith, not by sight. So what do, how do we describe this charismatic chaos? How do, how do we describe this? I call it sensationalism. Sensationalism. That's the ism for that one. We have ritualism, we have intellectualism, and we have sensationalism. Everything's about their feeling, and they get a vibe from it. Now, I've just about run out of time, and the last one is the carnal church. And by that, I don't just mean mega churches. You have some of these mega churches where you'll have somebody like a Joel Osteen and he gives this positive self affirmation message and that type of deal. And they have, you know, 50,000 members and stuff like that. But this thing, this carnality, it has to do with flesh. The word carnivore or the word carnival, that's carne, the word flesh. It's carn carnality. You have believers in Jesus Christ, you have churches, whether they be part of. Protestantism, now, I'm not even including that, uh, Catholicism, because they're not even Christian churches. But I'm, I, and, and I'm not saying, and let me clarify this, I'm not saying no Charismatics are saved, or no Presbyterians or Methodists or Lutherans or Reformed or Orthodox are saved. They just have some problems doctrinally, some major problems. And these problems have led into movements that have affected even Bible-believing Christians from time to time. You need to know the truth about this stuff. So what about carnal churches? What about carnal carnality in churches and in Christianity? It's not just in the mega churches, although you can see it in that. And I read one article of a guy and he traveled to all these mega churches. He was doing an assessment and a thing and he said one of the mega churches he went in, it felt more like a nightclub than it did a church. So I'll give you these things. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about these and then we'll be done. The mood of these churches. When you go in the church, does it feel like a church? Does it feel like it's just part of the world? And look, I know you can worship God under an oak tree. I'm not saying that. But the mood of these places, the atmosphere, the informal style. You know, some of these pastors, they believe that they need to be informal and we need to try to, the idea is to try to make the world feel as comfortable as they can so they'll want to come into church. So I'm not going to wear a suit and tie, even though you may wear one, you know, a doctor's going to wear one when he gives a presentation. A politician is going to dress his best. Uh, someone going to a funeral service is going to dress their best. When we come to church, let's just dress down. The idea of dressing up for church had to do, back in the old days, not Catholicism, where you put, you know, there's half a piece of grapefruit on your head, crazy looking fish thing on your head, and wear all these robes. What is a man going around, by the way, I always say it, anyway, you call him father and he's wearing clothes that looks like a mother. He's wearing clothes like a woman. I'm not going to wear a dress. I'm sorry. Anyway, 
the idea of wearing your Sunday best was that you respected church because it had to do with worshiping God and hearing something from God. That's the idea. It's not that we want people to look a certain way so we can say we're holy. That's where the idea come from. But the mood is to downplay church, to drag it through the trash. That's the mood. Informal style. That brings me to this one. I don't care if you like this or not, by the way. Music. There is a difference in carnal music and spiritual music, and I'm not talking about words. I'm talking about melody, I'm talking about syncopation, and I'm talking about beat, and I'm talking about all the elements and what mood is created by the music. And I know there are some preachers, maybe not even Bible-believing preachers, that they feel this and they know this and they dare not say anything because of these praise teams and there's music leaders and they know they have all these concerts and these extracurricular things because the people are drawn because they like the music. And I'm not saying that some of the words of some of these songs might not be okay. But I can't even hear the words because of the music. You say, why? It's carnal. You say, how dare you say music? Music is amoral. Literature is not immoral. By amoral, I mean it's not moral. They say music has no moral quality to it. It's just kind of blank. Literature is not that way. Art is not that way. Why would you think music can be just whatever? No, there's a certain type of music that will make you upset, make you mad, pump you up, get your, get your flesh moving. And there's a certain type of music that will calm you. And the music and these churches, and whether it's large or small, that's why I can't stand this canned music that they pipe in. You say, why? Because they pipe it in. Number one, it always goes a wire. It always goes haywire. And it doesn't line up with the person. It's got some crazy sound. It sounds like honky-tonk music or whatever. But Christians are so carnal now, they don't, it doesn't even phase them. Some of you are so, so used to listening to the world's music, you don't even know what good music is. Is carnal not spiritual? Then the message. What is the message? The message in carnal churches appeals to the flesh and not to the spirit. Now by that, I mean that it is very weak biblically. It's not strong. And I don't believe in harsh preaching. I do believe in hard preaching. We need preachers who aren't afraid to say, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. And if you don't start living right, God's going to whip you. God chastens His sons and daughters. And we ought to preach on sin. It's wrong to do certain things. It's wrong to live together if you're not married. It's wrong to pop the tops off beer cans and drink the alcohol. It's a sin. It's wrong to listen to bad music. It's wrong to use uh, profanity. Yeah, all kind of things are wrong and preachers ought to preach. And it's not supposed to be easy. It is sometimes hard. Preaching should get under your skin a little bit. And occasionally the preacher might raise his voice and froth at the mouth. And he might be very light spoken. Some of the hardest messages I've heard have been from soft-spoken men that had power behind the words they were saying because it was biblical preaching. Not this soft, coping, sharing, let's everybody just love everybody type of thing because they don't want to offend anybody. When a preacher stands in the pulpit, there's no foes, there's no friends, there's no family, and there's no finances. It's open season. That's how it should be anyway. The message. It's weak. It's, it's not offensive. And I kind of mentioned this, but it's all about marketing. They're marketing to clientele. They're trying to see what people like, and then they're going to put a coffee house in the church, or they're going to put a, a, a bowling alley in the church, and the bigger ones, or they're going to they're going to start, you know, put the screen, a little small church, have some big screen up there so people get used to looking at a screen instead of looking in a book. God wants you to look in a book, not a screen. You're looking at enough screens all the time anyway. Don't you have one of those stupid phones? And then you got a stupid phone, then you got a stupid TV, and then you come to church and you're going to have a stupid screen. So that, you say, what does that equal? That equals a stupid Christian and a stupid church. You say, you said that? Yeah, I just said it. You need to look in a book. I know some people have eye trouble 
and things like that, and they have to use the iPads because they have literal handicaps. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this crazed where you got to have the little bouncy ball go around and have the little hymns up there. Why can't you read out of a hymn book? What's the matter with you? Well, you just want to be old-fashioned. You just want to go back in the past. No, that's not what I'm talking about. There is a spirit behind that stuff. The marketing thing. We want people just to be able to walk in without their Bible. Are you so lazy you can't bring your Bible to church? This is it's bad. And the idea is seeker sensitive. Now what's, what's the end of this thing? What is the ism of this? This thing is emotionalism. And it's not necessarily the sensationalism because I'm dealing with churches that aren't necessarily charismatic. Although... There's a whole study that we could do and show the influences negatively from the charismatic movement into just standard churches. I mean, a lot of the music, it, it comes out of that stuff. It comes from the charismatic, non-denominational background. And it, slept, it, it, it has crept into some of the traditional and conservative churches. However, I say it's more emotionalism because the messages are geared toward the emotions. And I'm not saying we don't need to give heed to our emotions. We do. And God deals with our emotions. But it's more of a feminine driven type of ministry. It's all about how you feel. And look, I know God has sympathy with us and God does help us with our feelings. But the emphasis and the focus is on people instead of Jesus Christ. The emphasis and focus is on you and your emotions and your trouble instead of the person of Lord Jesus Christ and focusing on Him and what He wants us to do and how we can get up close to Him and fellowship with Him. Instead, we want to bring Jesus Christ down to where we are. The emphasis is wrong. We could add one more, but I won't. I could mention coronavirus and fear and isolationism and all that, but I won't get into that because we're right in the middle of that right now. But these are four curses on Christianity, and I hope that you can take these historically and you can back up and look at them and learn from them. And as you deal with these different elements, especially the carnality creeping in the church, introspectively say, okay, am I a spiritual or a carnal Christian? Because our church is not going to be any more spiritual than the members of the church. And if you are more driven to the flesh and to follow your flesh and your feelings and your emotions, then you are to follow the Holy Spirit leading you biblically and with the Bible, then you need to repent of that. And you don't need to focus on the flesh. You need to focus on the Spirit of God. So I hope these... These things will help us. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for clarity that we can take the Bible and put it upside these movements. Help us to shoot straight and to try the best of our ability to do what we're supposed to do as Christians and as a church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.